Okay, well, let's make a start. Good morning to those of you in Europe and Africa. Good afternoon and evening to those of you joining us from Asia. A very warm welcome to you all. Thank you for joining this, the 12th of our regular series of short courses on pumping topics. This one will last about 40 minutes, allowing us plenty of time for a Q&A session at the end of the, uh, end of the presentation. We're into session 12 now, and I expect most of you will have attended one or more of the previous sessions. So I'm foregoing the, the usual four or five slides reminding you of who we are and, where we, and what we do, and I'll move straight into the topics at hand. The slides that I'm not bothering to show you are at the end of the presentation and will be in the PDF copy you receive, so you can uh, peruse them at your leisure. Let me start the screen share. Here we go. Well, here's a listing of all the previous short courses we've run during the year. If you've missed any of them, you can get a copy of the materials and of the uh, slideshow um, by contacting our marketing department. Send an email to info at ruhrpumpen.com referencing the short courses by Simon Smith. So this seminar is going to look at vertical pumps. As I mentioned in part one two weeks ago, I quickly realized that this was too big a subject to cover in one 35 to 40 minute session, so I divided it into two. Two weeks ago in part one, we covered VS1, VS2 and VS3 pumps. Well, in today's session, we will cover VS4, VS5, VS6 and VS7 pumps. We will be holding a Q&A session at the end, so please use the Q&A facility at the bottom of your screen to ask any questions or to make any comments. I will address those that I can live at the end of the session, and the rest will address by mail in the coming days. We are recording this session, and will be, it will be, <clears throat> we will make it available to everybody, all attendees, as a YouTube video, uh, and by emailing you a PDF version of the slideshow, as well as the Q&A summary from both of today's sessions. So that's what we are looking at, VS4 and 5. VS4 is a volute type side discharge pump. VS5 is similar to VS4, but it's a cantilever design with a rigid large diameter shaft, so no line shaft bearings. VS6 is the diffuser type double case, and VS7 is the volute type double case. It's the same thing, um, but more visual. So first VS4, there are many manufacturers of this type of pump, Ruhr Pumpen, of course, FlowServe, Sulza, ITT Goulds, Morelli, KSB, Amaranth, Koloska, Ibarra, and literally dozens of others. Now, in the following slides, we're going to show two constructions of pump. The standard construction, water and effluent pumps, and the semi-engineered API 610 version. Most of the aforementioned manufacturers do it pretty similarly. So what I'm showing you here is not unique to Ruhr Pumpen. And this, of course, is in line with our principles of making these courses educational rather than product placement. So on the left, we have the VSP, the vertical sump pump, the standard construction pump. And on the right, we call it the VSP Chem, the API 610 version for the chemical and process industries. Here's a summary slide of the standard construction pump. You see solids handling up to four inches diameter, 
Cast iron is the standard construction, cast iron and steel. There's grease lubrication. There's a threaded discharge pipe, 150 pound rating. Non-clog and standard chemical pump hydraulics. And here is the VSP Chem, the API version. You see it has an, either an open or a Barsky impeller. A uh, Barsky impeller, in case you don't know, is like this. Uh, it's a low flow, high head impeller. Comes in both the standard materials, but also all the API materials um, per um, the, the materials list in API 610. Can be grease or external flush lubed, and the bearings are oil lubed or grease lubed. Usually has a welded discharge pipe, and we can have 300 pound flanges if we like. Has a circular flange to suit um, a tank mount. The application range. I don't think I need to spend too long on that. And this is um, the VSP Chem, the uh, API 610 version is very frequently installed in horizontal tanks of this sort. So sitting on top of the, uh, the one of the manhole covers for want of a better word. Whereas the VSP industrial typically sits above an open sump like this. For being installed in an open sump, the VSP has a square mounting plate for sitting on the, the deck frame. Here's the, uh, the range. Um, You'll note that the VSP Chem has flows up to 1900 cubic meters an hour, which is twice the capacity of the competition, the major competition. I'll leave this up very briefly. It's a range chart for the standard pump. Um, it's 60 Hertz, I'm afraid. <laughs> And here for the API version, again, 60 Hertz, I'm afraid I do need to get some 50 Hertz charts prepared. So working through the pump. Motor stand, the motor support stand, designed to withstand the down thrust. There's a thrust bearing in here, coupling guard, of course and is designed for either NEMA C-frame or IEC D-flange motors. There's the head plate. We're showing a round one here. Would be square normally on the, uh, on the industrial pump. Lifting lugs, three on the round plate, four on the square pump, square plate. Earthing lugs, grounding lugs. Now we're looking at the bottom end of the pump. So we see the basket strainer, which is optional. You wouldn't need it in clean pumpage, but you would always use it in, uh, um, in dirty pumpage. It's designed, of course, not to keep out polythene bags and things. It's designed to keep out bolts and large debris. The hydraulic coverage, the uh, hydraulics are from the chemical process pumps. So they're identical to the horizontal ANSI pumps. We just install them into this type of pump. Bearing here is Petrocoke tape for the VSP Chem and it's bronze in the standard cast iron pump. Here's the discharge pipe. This is representative of the bottom of the pit or tank. Optional design can have a replaceable shaft sleeve here on the shaft if you've got abrasive liquids. The 
impellers located by keys and an impeller nut to hold it in place. And note that on the VSP chem, the VSP, the uh, shaft nut is extra long to make sure it covers all the threads. Looking at the surface discharge now, and you can see on the standard pump, it's a threaded flange, threaded slip on flange here and threaded at the surface plate. Whereas on the VSP chem, the API version, it's welded in place and we have a butt welded flange here. Lubrication, most commonly it is grease lubricated. So you have one lubrication line for each of the line shaft bearings. Uh, here are the grease fittings here, and we see it comes into each bearing. Alternatively, you can have an external flush. So here's the external flush connection, and that would come down one line to all the bearings with a T-piece at each one. Another alternative is to self-flush the line shaft bearings, taking a T off the discharge pipe here. A cyclone separator could be fitted if you need to, if you have solids in the discharge and you still want to go self-lubricated rather than externally lubricated. There's the mounting plate, the surface plate, square on the standard pump, circular on the API pump, circular designed to be flange mounting. And these drillings will match um, 150 pound or 300 pound um, flanges for your tank. Lifting lugs, three or four. Often a sole plate is supplied and that sole plate would be shipped early and for setting in the uh, concrete foundation when it's poured. You see, it would have jack screws to level it. And then we would supply the pump with a round mounting plate to sit on top of that sole plate. Bearing brackets, two designs, one for grease lubrication, which is cast, it's a smaller thrust bearing, uh, and a fabrication for when it's oil lubricated. Here we see the oil bath type. There's the oil bath, here's the bearings, labyrinth seal above and below to avoid the oil leak. We have um, all bearings a single row for four and six pole speeds and double row for when we're running at two pole speed. Looking now at the ceiling of the line shaft as it goes through the head, uh, through the mounting plate. On the standard construction pump, which is of course sitting on an open tank, um, there's no ceiling here. This would be open. Um, there's no pumpage in this pipe, so you're not going to get any fluid through. You might get some vapors or gases through. So if you like, you can have a lip seal here. This is on the, um, the open pump design. Remember, it's an open tank, so you're getting fumes coming all the way up around the pump anyway, so we don't see any purpose in putting a seal in there. But you can have it if you wish. Different story, of course, on the VSP chem, the API version, because if it's mounted on a fully enclosed tank, it will need some sort of sealing because it'll be a pressurized tank at some stage. So it would be pushing va uh, vapors up, up here. So it's quite common to have um, 
either a mechanical seal or gland packing there. Okay, if it's a mechanical seal, it can be a dry running gas seal. That would be our recommendation. Could be a single wet seal, could even be a dual seal. It takes a conventional flange mounted motor, either IEC or NEMA. No thrust capacity required because the thrust bearing is in the pump. Couplings, standard uh, rubber L jaw design for the standard pump and a, an all metal flexible coupling for the VSB chem, like uh, the Metastream coupling. On an API pump with a mechanical seal, well, depending on the type of seal, you might need a seal support system. Plan 74 might be used on a gas seal or a, uh, um, yeah, on a gas seal, or plan 53, 52 for a dual seal. We frequently supply accessories such as level indicators, temperature indic uh, indicators, RTDs, and accelerometers. A, a variation on the VSP chem is a jacketed pump, um, which would uh, commonly be used for um, sulfur, molten sulfur, to make sure that it doesn't uh, solidify in the pump. Or if it does solidify, the steam quench, the steam through the jacket will melt it again. So all parts of the pump are jacketed there. Quick look at some of the others, some of the competition. This is the ITT Gould's API offering. Very similar in many ways. Not the same range as uh, Royal Bump and we go up to about um, 1900 cubic meters an hour with our API pump. This is the FlowServe non-API pump. It's um, modifiable with some API features. goes up to about 1400 cubic meters per hour. Flowserve also have a full API version. Again, many of the same features as the real pump and pump. It can be fitted with um, inducers when, uh, when necessary. And it goes up to about 1000 cubic meters per hour. Here is the Sulza, the non-API non version here. I'm not sure if they have um, a full API. It's not obvious on their website. I would imagine they do. Moving on briefly to the VS5 cantilever pump. Not too much to say here. Um, you don't come across them very often. Um, they have a heavy duty self-supporting shaft, the big, thick, heavy shaft, instead of the fragile, thin diameter pump uh, shaft on the VS4. No line shaft bearings. They're typically used in high solids content service slurries. This is a flowserve image here on the left, and here is a Sulza one on the right. There hasn't been the demand for Royal Pump and to actually develop one of these. So move on to VS6. Double casing diffuser type vertically suspended pump. Often called can suction pumps or vertical barrel pumps. They're traditionally used when you have very low even zero NPSH available at grade. Works on the basis if you have naught zero meters NPSH here, then you, three meters down, you have three meters of NPSH available. So we make the pump long enough by putting spool pieces in as necessary to 
position the first impeller, no enough to give you sufficient NPSH margin. But it's not just an NPSH saver, it's a space saver too. 20% of the floor space of the equivalent BB2. And it's a cost saver too, less expensive than the equivalent BB2. One seal, one sealing system, and less expensive than the equivalent BB2. But civil engineers don't like digging holes. There can be good reasons, such as water tables and groundwater quality. But if you can persuade them to do so, you're saving all the way. Big users of these pumps, light hydrocarbons, that's C2, C3, C4, condensate water in power stations, ammonia, liquid oxygen, liquid nitrogen. They're available in API 610 and non-API, Hydraulic Institute standard construction. But you'll come across two different styles of VS6 pump. The radial design on the left, which is primarily a European design, and the Francis vein design on the right, which is predominantly of American origin. The American design was a spin-off from borehole pumps which are widely used across the Americas and indeed across much of the rest of the world too. With borehole installations, you're trying to get as much water as possible out of as small a diameter well as possible, as well as maximizing efficiency. The length, number of stages, is not an issue. Hence the Francis vein, high capacity, small diameter, high efficiency, at lower head per stage. European manufacturers, on the other hand, they were not big in borehole pumps. We have plenty of surface water in Western and Northern Europe, so VS6 pumps were developed from horizontal process pumps, so with radial designs. They tend to be shorter and bigger diameter than their American counterparts. They'll also have flatter curves with a say a 25% typical head rise, compared with about 40% for the Francis vein. Rohrpumpen has both designs available. Our German heritage design, the radial design, and our American heritage design of Francis vein. So we can offer the best fit for any given situation. Here's a range chart for the semi-engineered or modularized range. It's a priceless pump largely. So up to about a thousand cubic meters per hour and heads up to about 850 meters. And here is the engineered pump range. We can put some pretty big mixed flow pumps into, uh, into a can. The well, pumps are available with above ground suction, like here, or below ground, here. It depends how the user is running his pipe work. Process pumps are almost always above ground. Below ground tends to be in water service. You specifying engineers need to think a little when you calculate your system NPSH, the available NPSH for us. You frequently tell us the NPSH A at the center line of the suction here, which means you're assuming a value here for this distance. Better would be, because you don't know what that is, we don't know it until we actually select the pump, so better is to tell us the NPSH available here at grade. And then we will then calculate the required length of the pump to give us the NPSH margin required, usually one meter of margin above the NPSH A. And we can also tell, then tell you where the flange is gonna be. With Below ground suction, 
we do want you to tell us the NPSH available at the suction flange because you know where that flange is. We will then calculate the rest of the uh, data, work out the length that we, we require. With the below ground, we need to make sure we have a minimum of two can diameters of length. More commonly though, it'll be the NPSH that determines the length of the can. Four mounting options. The standard design would have a square mounting plate on the barrel. The top flange of the barrel would be a square mounting plate, and that would set directly on prepared foundations. Sometimes we would supply a square sole plate to be provided, which would be set in the foundation when it is poured. And then the barrel mounting flange sits on top of that. Sometimes it will be a steel frame or base plate and the barrel would sit on top of that. And the fourth type is a separate circular flange that was that came into um, prominence in API 610 8th edition. It was a requirement of 8th edition. Uh, it was dropped in uh, 9th editions and, and subsequent editions. Uh, it's still there as an option, but um, not necessary as such. It did make the pump very much taller by, well, typically this much. The pump comes in API and non-API designs. Non-API, which is usually in water service, may have threaded bowls and be cast iron. It will have integral wearings as standard and taper lock bushes to fasten the impellers. The API build will have flanged bowls on all sizes. It will have replaceable wearings on impeller and case and it will have keyed impellers. Some vendors, real pump and included, use a low NPSH first stage impeller to shorten the pump as much as possible. These specially designed first stages have been designed to have a wide operating range while maintaining good NPSH performance. Others will use a, uh, an inducer to do much the same thing. How well this works depends on the design of the inducer. Historically, inducers had a U-shaped NPSH curve, which limited the operating region. More recent designs have a broader range. The oil and gas industry is very suspicious of inducers and many specs forbid them. Here are the main features of an API build VS6 pump. So it is built using code certified welders and it follows ASME 8 stresses. It has weld neck flanges with full penetration welds. Surface mounting flange might be supplied. Split ring and key impeller mounting. Separate impeller and case wearings. Nearly always flanged bowls. Especially now that 12th edition of API 610 has forbidden use of cast iron uh, within the pump. That means um, we wouldn't be using threaded bowls at all. External seal chamber sized in accordance with API 682. So we can take any API 682 seal. There are some more features on the left and their benefits on the right. We see we have a, a four piece rigid adjustable coupling and that maintains 
the alignment and allows you to remove the mechanical seal without having to remove the motor. As an integrally welded bearing spider, I'll show you that a bit more later, but it ensures perfect shaft, shaft alignment. Flanged and bolted bowls for all metallurgies, so ease of maintenance with galling materials. Positive split ring and key, metal rabbited fits with O-rings. Low NPSH first stage to ensure shockless fluid entry, minimize NPSH required and give you an overall shorter pump length. And a bearing in the bottom case to support the shaft at that critical suction area. <clears throat> Here are some of the differences between the European radial design and the American Francis vein design. These are the radial design. And what you'll see is a tie bolt design with the stages sandwiched together. This is most commonly seen for these. Also when lengthening the pump for NPSH regions, they normally just lower the first stage rather than the entire rotating element as they do on the Francis vein. Now, as European motors seldom accommodate thrust, the thrust belt bearing is built into the pump head as standard construction. It's an optional construction on the Francis vein. The non-API pump, well, this has some cost savings achieved in this less arduous and hazardous service. It'll have slip-on flanges. Uh, it'll have integral wearings, uh, giving you much lower initial cost. Collet mounted impellers, again, lower in initial cost. Um, I don't show it here, but the barrel will be flat bottomed probably. Uh, it will also be designed only for suction pressure whereas commonly on the API version, it's designed for um, full discharge pressure as well. Let's look at the difference between collet mounted and split ring and key. Split ring and key you will always have on an API pump. Um, positive retention, which is much more important when pumping hot and cold liquids, and it's less susceptible to loosening subject to shock loads. Collet mounted impeller has been used for many, many years on borehole pumps. Uh, it's a good secure method on water service. You just don't want to use it in, uh, in, in process conditions, hot hydrocarbons or cold hydrocarbons. The non-API pump may well have integral wearings. In other words, we don't have replaceable wearings here but the API pump will always have renewable wearings, both case side and impeller side, and that's required by code. On the non-API version, we encourage you to look at integral wearings initially. When the first major overall overhaul occurs, probably after about five years, you can machine and fit bowl wearings at that time to re re renew the um, clearances. Then at the second major overhaul, say at about 10, 15 years, then you can machine and fit impeller wearings at that stage. And like I say though, on the API version, you, you have them by code. The nozzle head, well being a fabrication, we can design and build it pretty much any way you want or specify. We do have some pre-engineered designs, of course. The API version will meet the nozzle loading requirements, can be two times um, API 610 loads, has 300 pounds stat flanges as standard, can be 600 or 900 when needed. The non-API pump has 150 pounds stat flanges as standard, both designs have a register fit, a rabbit fit for the motor sitting on top there.
suction can, the barrel, and the API pump, usually designed for 40 bar. The non-API barrel, usually with a flat bottom and designed for just for suction pressure. 416 stainless steel shaft, standard on this type of pump. Now here we are looking on the top end of a column section, and what you see is a bearing spider that has been welded and machined with the column flange. Now this ensures perfect alignment, which is very important when you consider that a pump can easily be 30 foot long and running at 3600 RPM. Carbon impregnated bearings are the standard, Graphaloy being the main major name. As I mentioned, the API version has seal chambers, which are suitable for API 682 seals. Now we prefer to have seal systems separately mounted on their own support stand. This sort of cantilevered load off the side of the pump is not good for nozzle loading or for vibration, but we can do it as we show here. I mentioned earlier that the base design for the American design VS6 is with thrust taken in the motor. Now, most European and Asian motor suppliers do not have the, this construction uh, as standard, so we have an optional construction with a thrust bearing in the pump. Here is a grease lubricated bearing used on the smaller sizes. You see it sits on top of the mechanical seal flange. Like this. There's the mechanical seal, there's the thrust pot. For the larger pumps, we have an oil lubricated bearing built into the motor stand. Like this. And this. Finally, the VS7 volute type pump, not nearly as common as the VS6. It flows up to about 18,000 cubic meters an hour and heads up to 150 meters. It has a double suction impeller, taking flow from below and above. This leads to lower NPSHR, but it is a bigger diameter than a single suction diffuser design and it's a heavier casting. So what you gain on the roundabouts, you lose on the swings. Not as extensive a range of hydraulics as the VS6, but when they hit a sweet spot, it's a winner. This is where they have an advantage. The single impeller develops the higher heads and capacities without the need for additional stages. So this can eliminate the use of intermediate bowl bearings so it can be vulnerable when handling abrasive fluids. We're seldom handling abrasive fluids with uh, a, a VLT. It would normally be in, um, in, in clean service. Here's the range chart. Mid range here is 2,270 2, cubic meters an hour and 90 meters of head. So it's a, a big pump. Shown here as a two-stage pump on the left with a mixed flow second stage, and here as a single-stage pump on the right. Double volute design, so four discharges, two, three, and one at the back, joining into one outlet, combining into one outlet. And here you see it as a first stage in a multi-stage pump with diffuser series stages.
Well, that pretty much concludes the fun for today. I hope you found it useful. I just get to advertise the next of the short courses. The next one is going to be on performance testing and inspection of API 610 pumps. 17th of February, that's three weeks today. Again, two sessions, one for the Eastern Hemisphere and one for the Western Hemisphere. The invitation will be published very soon, put it in your diary. After that, 10th of March, three weeks later, startup, commissioning, and troubleshooting of centrifugal pumps. Put that one in your diary too. Okay, I'm leaving this meeting open for a little while to allow you to post in the Q&A box, and I'll endeavor to answer those that only need a short answer here and now. Those that need a fuller answer will be answered within a few days. Anything you think of later, email to info at ruralpumpin.com or to me directly, smith at ruralpumpin.com. Our marketing team are standing by to direct your questions or suggestions to the best person to answer them. And they will be sending you the YouTube recording and a PDF of the presentation and the summarized Q&A from both of today's sessions. If you need a certificate of completion for this short course, again, email to info at rawpumpin.com and they'll sort you out. Now, uh, on with the Q&A, do I have any questions? Yes, so far we have about four. So let's have a look. Carlo Maria Di Felice, Sometimes it happens that the flange of the vessel where the VS4 pump shall be mounted is not perfectly play, plain. And you notice that only at sight, or the vessel is not perfectly level due to the thermal expansion of ambient temperature or due to other thousand effects can happen during installation activities. In case of a large diameter vessel, also with a boot, it can happen that the pump shaft can crash with the, with the boot wall or any way not working correctly due to misalignment. Do you have any solution to be placed at site in case you notice the not correct planarity of the surface? That's, I don't think we can compensate for bad design. Um, <laughs> if, if you haven't designed um, a, 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 a flat, surface for the pump to mount on. Yes, I can see how on a longer pump, the, uh, the, the lack of flatness can cause a problem. There's no easy solution. Certainly on a, on the, when it's on an open sump and if a sole plate is then supplied, the sole plate can, will have jacking screws to allow to, you know, to adjust that. But you can't do the same thing on a, um, on a, on a flange mount on a pump that's going on a, on a sealed tank. So no, there's no short answer to that. You need to get it right. Cesar Gill, what is the difference between using a flat bottom can, non-API, versus a curved bottom can, API? Um, I think the elliptical design not only looks better, but I, I think it probably uh, allows a better flow into the into the suction of the pump, I think. But it's not a big deal as such. Uh, there are hundreds of thousands of, uh, of flat bottomed, not open. It's it's cheaper. Um, and I dare say, yes, with the elliptical end on the API, of course, you're able to do a full penetration weld, a butt weld on that bottom seam. That will be the that, that will be the key thing as opposed to a um, an angled weld, um, forgotten the name. Fatko Rahman says, would you like to send this presentation material link after this event and certificate of attendance, if you mind via email? Yes, you, um, we will send it. Anyone who is registered and has attended this, uh, this course will receive the materials in the next few days.
Clive Searle. Hello, Clive. I've known you for many years. Excellent presentation, Simon. Thank you. I've requested all previous presentations. What is the experience of rural pump on, on molten sulfur pumps? Um, yes, we certainly have done molten sulfur pumps. Uh, I don't have immediately to hand a reference list for that, but uh, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll check it up and, uh, and, and, and get back to you. That's all the Q&As at the moment. Let's have a look at the chat in case somebody has put something in here. Yes, Simon Hudel has said, when the barrel of a VS6 pump will be purged, how can the barrel be drained? What is the common practice? Good question, and I'm sorry I didn't cover this in the, uh, in the presentation. It's quite common, usual, in fact, to have um, a dip pipe all the way down the length of the pump uh, so that you can drain it through that dip tube from a flange on the head plate. Less common, but still quite frequent, would be a drain right at the very bottom of the, of the, of the barrel and coming up, up the side. Capucci Venkata has said mechanical seal plans for petroleum product pumps. Yes, very good. There's limits to uh, how much I could squeeze in today. The most common one is a plan 13 um, for the uh, inboard seal. Um, could commonly be a plan 52 on the outboard seal or these days more commonly a 53. Um, but plan 13 is the usual uh, piping plan. Pakawat Temya says, does raw pump and have some kind of vertical pullout pump? Well, largely this is a pullout design. Um, you would leave the barrel in place, uh, release the, um, the, the suction and discharge flanges, and then the pump lifts straight out vertically and goes off to the, uh, to the workshop to be worked on. That's all within the chat. I'll just look back at the Q&A. Yep, we have here from an anonymous attendee. Please explain how the setting depth on a VS6 is calculated by vendors with zero NPSH available. Okay, let's assume we have zero NPSH at grade. Now, if the pump impeller needs, let's say three meters of NPSH and Let's assume that the specification requires and good, good practice requires a one meter of margin, safety margin. That means we need to put that impeller at three meters plus one meter, a minimum of four meters below grade to ensure that you have the, uh, um, the NPSH available. So that's what we do. Um, start from the NPSH available and we lengthen the pump such that we have that that availability with a, with a meter of margin, a safety margin. Well, that appears to be all the questions that we have at the moment. So it's, I will uh, close this meeting then. Thank you for attending today. Oh, hang on, another one's come up. A couple more come up. We're doing them in the chat. I would prefer it if you do it in the um, in the Q and A, please. It makes it much easier for me to process it later. Um, Kap, uh, Kupachi Venkata has said, same flow, same head. BS versus VS, which is economical. And I'm not getting this. Not understanding the question. Sorry, BB8, he says, B BB8. So but, uh, between... Well, a between bearings pump will normally be a lot more expensive than a vertical suspended pump. Um, and the reasons will largely be one mechanical seal instead of two, one a seal system instead of two sealing systems. So you'll, you'll usually find that 
a vertically suspended pump will be cheaper than its equivalent between bearings pump. Fatkur Rahman says, thank you for valuable presentation. Du, du, du. Success for marketing raw pump and team. Usually any calculation data for vertical turbine to know the power of the engine by carbon shaft or vertical motor flange mounted and height of setting pump foundry. Okay, it's a little complex question. I'll try and get you an answer in, in my written responses. Thanks for the presentation. Do vertical pumps rotation, is it always clockwise? In the Southern hemisphere, it would profit, would profit of advantage to have them on counterclockwise rotation. It doesn't make any difference whether they're designed as clockwise or counterclockwise, whether it be in the Northern hemisphere or the Southern hemisphere. Um, most um, American design pumps are counterclockwise looking from above, okay? But, it really doesn't matter. Um, a lot of European designs are clockwise and it really doesn't matter which way they spin, as long as you connect the motor the correct way, as long as you know which way it runs and um, connect it that way. And that's why all pumps will have a an arrow direction on the, uh, on the head plate. Okay. Uh, and Pakawat Temia, your question now, you've mentioned a particular type of pump. I'll look into that and I'll get you a, a response uh, in the summarized Q&A when I put that together uh, later today. Okay, well, um, let's close this, uh, close this meeting. Uh, just got to say thank you for attending today. I enjoyed preparing it and presenting it. Um, I hope you found it useful and see you for the next session on the um, 17th of February. Bye-bye.